coin, it's a one ounce gold coin. It has a $20 face value, right? When you travel and it shows a $20 face value, okay, well, you're maxed out at $10,000 before you have to declare something, but typically they take it at whatever the face is on it. everybody, this is Lisa Riley and I am the founder of Odo Synergy Services Women of Color Global Entrepreneur Network here in wonderful Silicon Valley. It's kind of cold right now. I want to thank you for joining us today at this live webinar to educate African American female entrepreneurs and the African American community at large on this global economic crisis and recession. We will also learn about the government changes and how inflation will impact our livelihoods, investments, wealth, and financial security. So I hope you have come with a lot of questions because I am excited to host the phenomenal Lynette Zing, who is the Chief Market Analyst for ITM Trading Company. Um, my co-host uh, today, Wanda Whitaker, found her on YouTube and was so excited and impressed and told me we had to have her. So we're going to be introducing her. She brings such economic knowledge and transparency and clarity on the economic chaos that we are encountering right now in the government and in, in our country. So we're excited to have her today. So she's going to give us an an overview of her background and talk about what is going on in our current economy. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the things going on in our government? What's going on in the financial services space and how we as African-American and people of color need to get prepared for this economic mm -hmm. reset. Lynette? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'm equally excited to be here today and my background i've been really doing this on some level since i was 10 so 1964. i've been a banker i've been a stockbroker, and i started studying currencies in 1987 and my work developed around really seeing those repeatable patterns so you don't necessarily have to be you know, understand this stuff at this, well, this level that I'm going to bring to you today, I think it's critical that you understand it. But generally speaking, if you can learn how to recognize those patterns and even where to go to see what the smartest guys in the room are doing for themselves, and then if you can emulate that in some way, you are most likely to be in the best possible position. Where we are is we are at the end of this currency's life cycle. And that's really what I wanted to give everybody a foundation with is what is money? Because we work for it, we barter with it, we even try to save it, but we don't understand what creates it and what supports it. So I wanna take you back to the beginning and just get really fundamental here on what is money. It's really a tool of accounting measure because we needed to be able to allow the economy to specialize, right? So you can have a baker, you can have a doctor, you can have, you know, a librarian. So we needed a way to measure our work. And money is also that tool of barter. I give you this, you give me that. And anything can be a tool of barter, and we'll get into that a little bit more. It's just what is universally accepted. Again, we try and save it for future use. And then finally, we want it to be a store of value so that no matter when we use it, we are always fairly paid for our labor. Nobody tells you this stuff because if you really understood how it was created and supported in the system, you would say, I don't, I'm not interested in that. So if we just kind of think about 
our labor, our time, our effort, our energy. That's what money is supposed to represent in a fair system. And frankly, when we were on a gold standard, well, it takes energy and labor to pull gold out of the ground. So when we were on a gold standard, you were trading your labor for somebody else's labor, which is a pretty fair way to do it. Additionally, because it is a commodity money, it's real, it's tangible, and never nobody ever talks about this, though they should, it's used across every single aspect of the global economy. So you have the broadest base of demand. In 6,000 years, gold, silver as well, have never gone to zero because, again, it's the broadest base of fire. It's used in electronics. It's used in the financial system. It's used in jewelry. It's used in flatware. It's used in art. It's used in medicine. So sometimes maybe that demand will be lower, sometimes greater, but there is always demand. It is in your control. Because back then, if you did not like what the government was doing, you would simply go to the bank, give them a $20 gold certificate, and pull that gold out of the system. So a gold standard puts uh, parameters around what a government can do. And of course, the government doesn't like that, neither do central bankers. So they came up with debt-based money, the Federal Reserve note. If you happen to have a bill in your pocket, if you pull that out and you look right across the top, it says Federal Reserve note. Well, a note is a debt instrument. So where we used to work for somebody trade our labor for somebody else's labor, now we are trading our labor for debt. And by the way, this debt does not pay, at least at this point, does not pay or charge interest. So it's debt with a zero coupon. That's a problem for the current uh, circumstance, and we'll talk more about that later. But in this debt-based system, it's under their control. They control inflation, which is not a monetary phenomenon. It's actually a fiat money phenomenon. And fiat means, I'm going to explain that in more detail in a second, but fiat, the literal translation is by decree. So it's government-based money, and we're going to talk about it. However, in the current system, if you work with dollars in your pocket, it's completely private. And they're having a problem. The government and the central bankers are having a problem with that. So we are moving into an age of digital currencies, which I know you're bringing up. And I think it's important because no doubt that's where we are being pushed. And particularly, uh, especially since the pandemic hit, the central banks have been really trying to, look, the system died in 2008, and they just put it on life support with all this printing, which we'll, I'll show you in a little bit. But they need to try and remain in control of this circumstance. Now, by the way, what central bank digital currency is, and these are their words, not mine, it is programmable fiat money. Yeah, start to think about that. You're going to trade your, and we're not going to have any choice, but we do have some choices. You're going to be trading your labor for something that they can program its value. And where in the current system, money is created from debt, right? You go in, you take out a loan in the bank, the bank then prints that 10 times that into existence and can loan it out more. That's how money is created in the system. I can't find really anything other than a computer algorithm that creates or backs this money. You know, what, what backs a, a, a Federal Reserve note? The full faith and credit of the government, right? That's what we're told. So if you translate that, as long as you trust the government and they can grow more debt, you'll keep loading, you'll keep lending to them. 
This programmable fiat money is in their control. And I love this one too. They call it controllable anonymity. So there's all this stuff around privacy, but if it's inside a computer database, you really have to ask yourself, how private is it going to be, right? And they can start out with all these protections, but considering that it's programmable, they can change those rules and those laws, which history shows us they have a lot, and you're not even going to be necessarily aware of it. So diversification, where you have some real money, might be a pretty good tool. Now let's get into what is the fiat money a little bit more. Because as I said earlier, fiat means by decree. So it's legalized government money. And I'm going to show you something that I'll bet a lot of people, I mean, if you're my age, you might remember it, but you might not know. Because these are just those pieces of paper, right? But prior to 1971, we also had 500, 1,000, 5,000, and $10,000 bills. Now, this was a way to carry, and we have, we had spoken, Lisa and I had spoken briefly before we came on about a way to carry wealth. And this was a way to carry a lot of wealth in a very small package. So as we were transitioning from a gold standard before, prior to 1971, when somebody, they didn't demonetize it because if a government says this is money, they can also say this is no longer money like they did in India in 2016. And they demonetized 85% of all the money that was out in the system. So you have to understand that. But they didn't want to make that really noticeable. So what they did is as that money, those larger bills came into the bank, they just did not distribute it again. And that's why we don't know even that we had those larger denominated bills. But talk right now and has been since 2008 of getting rid of the $100 bill and the $50 bill as well. Now, most likely those will be demonetized. In other words, you'll have a certain period of time to turn them in where they still can buy you some other form of money, probably the digital money. What it really does though, this is the part in their control. It allows governments and central banks to devalue your worth. Not just what you accumulate or get paid for, but rather what you do accumulate as well. Because last time I checked, a trillion times zero is still zero. So they do that in the current system, that's why I say currently through inflation, the central banks have the ability to raise and lower interest rates. If they want, like what they've been doing, we've had interest rates anchored at zero, right? Why is the stock market going up? Well, lots of reasons, but one big reason is because interest rates are at zero. So it costs virtually or almost nothing to borrow money if you are in a location close to the central bank, so the larger, larger corporations. And they get to use it when it has the most value. By the time it trickles through the system, it has a whole lot less value. So for governments, this is the invis invisible, almost invisible inflation tax. They don't have to go to legislation. They don't have to make it visible that they're raising your taxes because they might get pushback. For corporations, it benefits them because real wages are actually in decline. But hey, if you see your paycheck going up, like all this talk about minimum wage increases, oh my God, it's just a smoke screen to keep you engaged. So this is really, did you wanna say something? You mean Biden's uh, increase to fifteen dollars an hour is just a smokescreen? Well, sure. Let me show you why. I mean, he should be raising the minimum wage, but that's chump change. That's nothing. I mean, can can a family really live 
on $15 an hour, even on a full week, even with overtime? No. So it's robbery by design. <clears throat> they knew two key things. They knew a lot of things, but two key things when they created this system. They knew that people marry the legal money of the state. So dollar for dollar, as long as it has what's, what's coming, the digital dollar. Because people cannot imagine that the dollar can possibly go away. I've always had it. But, you know, I'm 66. So if anybody is out there, I can tell you right now, in July of, two, of 1971, if I had a $20 bill in my pocket and I had a $20 bill in September, I had no idea they just changed the entire global monetary system. But because they look very similar <clears throat> and everything was operating similarly, <clears throat> excuse me, bad time to get a little cold. But they also knew that by a continuing process of inflation, this is the founder of the system, by the way, by a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. That's John Maynard Keynes. He's the founder of Keynesian economics, which is what our current debt-based monetary system is based on. It's brilliant. I mean, you gotta give them credit for the brilliance. So let me show it to you in more form because the average wage in 1971 when we transitioned to this system was $9,500. And a family of four, one wage earner. And I'm not saying they were super wealthy, but they could manage with one wage earner on $9,500. The average wage in 2020, $48,516. So you would, everybody would say, well, pff, I'd rather have $48,000 than $9,000, except that it's what it will buy, which I'll show you in a second. But in 1971, the fixed price of gold was $42.22. So if you had been paid in gold, you would have gotten 225 ounces. If you did not get a raise... Not one little raise. The average spot price, which is also spot as a contract and manipulated, does not reflect the true value, but another discussion for another day, perhaps. But the average spot price of gold in 2020 was $1,773.73. So it, if you look at the average wage, you're really only getting... 27.35 ounces of gold. So you had real wage declines and you didn't even realize it. And that's why I said $15 an hour, right? Should be a whole lot more because had you not gotten a raise but been paid in the same number of ounces of gold, labor for labor, you would have had a wages of $399,110.26. And I'm kind of thinking that would have, you know, you, okay, family of four, you'd only need one wage earner at this moment because that's not always going to be true either. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that doesn't include the taxes that they have on commodities. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Inclusive of that. And when they you, continue to rise. Oh my God. I mean, I'm telling you, when you talk about taxes, this system is genius. They devalue the currency to make things cost, take more dollars to do it, and then they tax any of those gains. And, and when you sell a house <clears throat> or, a, or anything, so they're taxing inflation, and you don't even realize it because, hey, you bought the house for 20000 you sold it for 100000 Woohoo! but not when you look at the real value of your labor in terms of gold and in terms of silver as well. So, actually, Lisa asked me why I had all of this bread, okay? What they know 
is that inflation causes nominal confusion. So a $20 bill 20 years ago, a $20 bill 10 years ago, a year ago, it's still nominally exactly the same, $20. But what it will buy you is so much less. So let me give you an example of that. I don't even know if you can see how teeny weeny this is. This is a $1 gold coin. And before the Federal Reserve took over in 1913, it would buy you six loaves of bread. What's a $1 bill buy you? These, I bought 28 loaves of bread because you can, that's what you can buy with this 1 20th of an ounce of gold is 28 loaves of bread. Here, I've got more. But what can you buy? Bread, Pardon? You need some of that bread. You do, you do. And I'm donating it after I'm done with this. But I mean, I really want to make a point because this is what you need to understand in order to make educated choices that actually support your best interest first. What a concept, right? I mean, I still have, let's see, one, two. You get the point? I mean, I can keep going because I've got 28 loaves of bread here. Did you purchase them at the dollar store? Uh, well, Jacqueline got them. I'm not sure where she got them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's 28 loaves. Oops. All right. And one fell. Okay. What do you get with a dollar bill? This one we won't donate because I have a little cold. You get, if you're lucky, a third of a loaf. You see what I'm talking about? And that is what the guys in power, we're going into a reset. They're restructuring our entire financial system, our entire monetary base. So there are advantages. It's way more convenient to carry something in digital form, but if they can program it, do you think the loss of purchasing power is going to stop? Because I don't. And I will tell you, the strategy I created for myself is based on repeatable patterns. That's what my work is all about, to show you guys the patterns so that you can make educated choices. But Lynette, if I go to another country, my dollar will go down. If you go to, it depends. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's another illusion. There are uh, several ways to value a currency. One is against other fiat currencies. But they're all doing this, all of them. If you go to another country with this, this is globally accepted money. You can go anywhere in the world and boom, instantly have purchasing power. And speaking of going with dollars, well, you know, I mean, I've done a little bit of traveling and there was a time when boy, you know, that's what they wanted were dollars. They don't want dollars anymore. Right? So it's not so easy to do. You convert it into their currency. This is universally convertible. Okay? And you can, I always wear a lot of jewelry. And I do that to really make the point that I can carry a lot of wealth in a private and mobile form. Because these old coins, well, that's a $10. Okay, this coin, it's a one ounce gold coin. It has a $20 face value, right? When you travel and it shows a $20 face value, okay, well, you're maxed out at $10,000 before you have to declare something, but typically they take it at whatever the face is on it. On the new gold coins that they, that they mint now, it has a $50 face value. And the official US price of gold is $42.22. Even though the spot market is something like 1844 or, you know, 1850 right now. 
Why? Well, that's a really good question. So again, it's all in, look over here while we're doing this, but they're changing the whole system over here. Now, some people think that they would do an overt confiscation again. And I happen to be one of those people because desperate, pe desperate governments do desperate things and they did a confiscation in India at the same time that they demonetized their currency. And they've done, a, 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 in 2011, Venezuela did a confiscation as well. And they did it in this country in 33. And if you don't think inflation is a form of confiscation, please think again. Okay? It's also what enables and supports income and wealth inequality. Look at this. Wait till you see this. CEOs and make, and this is just through 2019. Guess what? In the pandemic, when everybody, when most people are suffering, this has jumped, right? But CEOs make 320 times as much as the average worker. Their income has kept up with inflation. The average worker's income has not. You see what I'm saying? You're sitting there shaking your head. When you, when you really kind of stop and think about that, does not, I know it's a good thing, Wanda, that you calmed me down before we started. Because <laughs> I got really, how many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? It's slavery. It's economic slavery. Yes, it is. In the 300 years, with the fiat money, roughly? Well, it's, you know, well, we actually, this is since 1971. 1913, they started on the path. And over between 1913 and 1971, they reduced the amount of gold that backed the currency. But we were, we haven't been able to use gold in, as currency since uh, 1933. In 1971, when Nixon, they put it so nicely, closed that gold window. What he really did was hand over full power of inflation to the Federal Reserve, which is a private corporation. Well, I thought it was the Gangster Reserve. Sorry, sorry. No, I, that's a much better name. <laughs> it's a much better name. I, and, you know, I'm not saying that everybody in these systems have nefarious intentions, but I will say that they actually look for, um, and this is gonna sound awful, but I'm not doing this to sound awful. When they're looking at the profile of who they're going to put in a position, they actually look for sociopaths because they cannot care about how that really impacts everybody. And the, everything is always under the guise of helping this inequality, but their system by design created this inequality. So I got to question it because I'm thinking they know a lot more about this stuff than I do, frankly. Now here you can see, this is from the Fred, one of my very favorite websites. That's the Federal Reserve Economic uh, or Education Department. Anybody can access it. And you can go in and look. At, it's amazing what you see when you look. But this is... The website. I want to put the website in the comments. Absolutely. And I think I also uh, put some links on this work. So we'll make sure you have the links so you can go and you can look at it for yourself. Because, you know, I'll give you all the tools you need to hold my toes to the fire. You know, absolutely. You should do your own due diligence. Don't take anybody's word, anybody's word for anything. So over this period of time, you can see how those at the top of the heap, that 1%, just got wealthier, and those at the bottom of the heap got a lot poorer by design, okay? Now, that would explain why distribution of wealth and income go to the top 1%, or the top, in this case, 20%. Okay? The 1% is even far more skewed than what you're seeing, especially through the coronavirus where you've got Main Street that is absolutely, you know, look, we, this is awful to say.
And I have an urban farm, as you know, because, and I converted my entire property into food production because food becomes the single biggest issue for people as we go through these transitions. So you need the things that will help sustain your standard of living because the system is without a doubt completely breaking down. And it really started in 2008. But take a look at this. This is federal debt as a percent of GDP. Now, GDP is gross domestic product. So that's all the money that flows through the system, right? And it used to be where you would have four cents that could produce a dollar's worth of growth. So four cents in government debt to a dollar's worth of growth. But we are up, this is the third quarter, we are like at 137%. So every dollar's worth of debt that the government creates actually doesn't produce any growth at all. It does make financial assets go up, right? The stock market, wait, I'll show you. So this is 2008, though, and you can see the speed at which that quantitative easing that the central banks and governments were creating money, but it wasn't fast enough. So in 2020, boom, straight up. You, you don't even get like a little bridging off, right? They can say all they want how great things are and how the gro I mean, I'm listening to CNBC this morning and they're talking about how we're going to get lift off and all we need is more stimulus, which is government money, free money going into the system. But who does that really benefit? Because what you're looking at here is in blue, this is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And this goes back to 2008 when they started the quantitative easing, which is free money for those that are closest to the central bankers. And the red is the S&P 500, so stocks. Now, I think it's pretty easy to see how correlated they are. This little area in here is when they were trying to reduce their balance sheet and raise interest rates, and it got real choppy for the stocks. But you see, we've been trained to think that if the stock market is going up, that is that everything must be okay. Because prior to 1971, quite frankly, if a corporation took on debt and they expanded their business, so maybe they bought some land, maybe they bought new equipment, maybe they hired more people, maybe they gave people a living wage, right? Well, that would be reflected in their stock price if they were doing more business and they were better. But honestly, now it's just how much debt can they take on their books? And I know, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. This is new money creation at the Federal Reserve. Now this is just the M2, so it isn't actually even the broadest base of new money creation. Can you see that itty bitty teeny weeny blip in 2008? Didn't look like a little blip in 2008, but compared to how much more they have pumped new money in the system, it looks like nothing. It looks like nothing. And the more money that they create, the less value, purchasing power value, that all of the money that's out there has. So $15 an hour, it's not a living wage. It's totally not a, 58,000 a year is not a living wage. It requires two people, two paychecks, and then in most cases, hey, the stimulus checks that were going out were to anybody making less than $75,000 a year or $150,000 a year if you're a couple. What's that tell you? Tell you right now, 150 grand in 1971 was a tremendous amount. You were in the 1%. I'll never forget, my father was a developer, and I don't know why this just stuck in my head. Maybe because I used to babysit for him. But I remember standing in the doorway, and this young couple, he was an engineer at, at IBM. And I remember my mom pounding the table and saying, he's a comer, 
He's a cover. He makes $12,000 a year. And my father built nice houses. And they'd go out every weekend. And they'd take their family on vacation. They'd probably save for retirement. they probably, you know, they probably save for their college educations. Right? He made $12,000 a year. What would happen to somebody making $12,000 a year today? Exactly. Exactly. But here's the real problem. Here's the problem why I say, and, and what I'm about to show you, if you don't look at any other charts or pay attention or go back to, this would be the one to go back to. This is probably the most important thing I'm showing you today. Because what this is, is the speed at which money changes hands. So it's the monetary velocity chart, which as you can see, peaked in 1997. So, so after 1997, taking on more debt really wasn't stimulative, right? Really didn't help. So let's say I have a good week and I say, oh boy, okay, now I can afford that car that I've been wanting to get. So, and I think my income is going to keep coming in and this is important piece right here. So I go out and I buy that new car. And then the person that I buy that car from makes a commission. And he goes, wow, now I can go and, and take my family on that vacation that we've been wanting to do. And while they're there, they go out to a restaurant. And because they're feeling flush, they leave a nice tip. And the waiter or waitress goes, oh, okay, now I can get Johnny those sneakers that he's been needing. So you see the speed. If people feel confident and comfortable that their income will be there, then they are more likely to spend money. What the government has used all these years, and it doesn't work, I mean, you can see it doesn't work, is the trickle-down theory, where they give everything to those at the top because, in theory, they'll then spend that money and stimulate the economy but you can see this graph from the Fred. Does it look like it's being stimulated to you? And beyond... That it never worked. No, exactly, Wanda, exactly. It doesn't work. But they keep doing it. Isn't insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? Insanity. Right. Yeah, Because this never was about equality. It was always about wealth transfer. And the World Economic Forum that's coming up, the title is The Great Reset, where they're talking about societal change, economic change, and financial change. And the bottom line is, you just have a few people that own everything, but everybody else owns nothing, and they're going to love it. Except that if you own nothing and you have to rent everything, and I'm talking about even the clothes on your back, then guess who gets to dictate how much that costs you? So they can say blah, 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 anything they want about equality, but don't you think they should have taught you about this stuff and how money is created and supported? Shouldn't they have taught you that in, in grade school? Exactly, exactly. And we still don't. I mean, there's a lot of trading platforms that want to teach you how to gamble. But I really haven't seen, I mean, there are a couple of other sites that are similar to ours where they really do want you to understand about money. And I think it's critically important because, again, how many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? Of course it is. It's being made available to the masses. 
Oh, of course it is. And you can also buy little pieces of stock. You got 10 bucks, go to Robinhood, you can get 10 different stocks. And what I'm saying is there are certain patterns that always repeat and getting the masses into the markets. You know, in 1927, for the first time historically ever, up until that moment, most central banks had a charter. 15 to 20 years was the average charter for a central bank because governments knew that they would inflate the money away and so they wanted the power to get rid of them so they could start over. But in 1927, and I don't think this was a coincidence, for the first time ever, they gave the Federal Reserve an unlimited charter. Their first charter was due to expire in 1933. Huh, coincidence? In 1928, that was when the industrialists, the bankers, the big kahunas, the 1% of that day, sold out of their Ponzi scheme stocks to the masses. Ever heard of the Roaring Twenties? They created, I mean, I, this is like a whole other video, but it used to be this 1 20th of an ounce of gold to back a $1 bill. In 1913, it was this 20th of an ounce of gold, now back $2.40. So that enabled them to create two and a half, almost two and a half times the amount of money in the system. And this is what always happens when they're kicking off a new system. They make it look like everybody's benefiting, but what they're really doing is, is you know, how do you catch a wild boar? You know, one side at a time. And they want you to volunteer because when you volunteer and things go south, who are you going to blame? And they say this, if you read the, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or any of their paperwork or reports, you hear this same thing over and over again. They want distance between how things are introduced to you versus what their policy is. Because then you don't associate it, right? You don't realize, here's a great example. You know, COVID-19... I've done a lot of research on this, and I went back into the lab, and it's public record, so anybody can do this, um, that they knew that this was going to happen. They absolutely knew it was going to happen. They have beautiful flow charts on how it can transmit from animals to humans. And they were working, and it's not just China. I mean, we were involved in it, the U.S. government agencies, a lot of educational facilities were globally, were involved in seeing, uh, creating a stronger and stronger strain of the SARS virus. And they knew this was coming. I'm wondering why they didn't create an antidote at the same time they were trying to create this stronger strain. Why in the world would you create a stronger strain if you weren't going to use it for benefit? And, you know, and now... Everybody's rushing to get vaccinated, and I'm not putting it down because I know people that have passed from COVID-19, so it's very, very real. And I went and got tested when I got a cold. I went and got tested just to make sure. I didn't think I had it, but just to make sure. I have to tell you, look at what's happened. It has sped everything up. The introduction of the digital currencies, Bitcoin came out in, in January 2009. The Federal Reserve started quantitative easing in March of 2009. I read the 1996 NSA white paper on how to create a cryptocurrency and the 1998 paper on smart contracts. So... You know, you'll have to forgive me if I don't think that that's the be-all or end-all because what they have is programmable money. So if they don't want you to use it, they just push a button and they change how that's programmed for you and me. And they can also control the anonymity or the privacy. So 
I might be a little jaded because of where I spend all of my time, which is in, frankly, really ugly stuff. Well, I don't spend all my time there. I go out to my pond and, you know, other things because I have to break away from that energy. But this is why I'm so passionate about this because when anything looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. But the other part of it is if it is so complex that you need an engineering degree, a specific engineering degree, to understand how something works, well, I don't have that engineering degree. So I'm not saying that that's not where we're going, and I'm not even saying that there are not opportunities there. But what I am saying is it would be hard for me to believe that central banks will give up their money monopoly. They did in the money flower, which I don't have in here, but they uh, did make a teeny weeny bit of space for private cryptocurrencies. They did. But most of those cur the cryptocurrencies are going to be central bank digital dollars that they control. And I can't, I have not yet, I, I'm continuing to look because I am definitely a lifelong learner and I really do want to understand this. Uh, but I'm continuing to try and figure out what is the foundation of the value of these cryptocurrencies. You know, it's the energy that they used up. Well, then you have no more use for it. With gold, it's recoverable. It's divisible. I mean, gold became the primary currency metal simply because it has attributes that no other currency or no other thing, they've tried lots of things over the years. But gold is finite, indestructible, divisible without loss of value. I mean, you can have a diamond, but if you cut that in half, it loses its value. And it is a labor-based store of value real money. It's it's tangible. So, uh, so uh, can we turn this into questions a little bit more? We can. We can. Well, I, I do have a little bit more on how gold behaves and what we're I'm dealing gonna, with. We'll keep going and then we'll open up the panel because I do have questions about transporting gold. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't think that this would be complete without seeing what happens with gold during the transitions that we have already entered, because we are resetting everything. And there are over 4,800 times fiat currencies that do not exist anymore, and this is what happens. They revalue it, not because I say it, but because this is how it's done. They take the fiat money, so in this country, dollars that have no intrinsic value are just used in one area, and they revalue it against gold money that's all intrinsic value because it has the broadest base of buyer. And then gold starts to express near its fundamental value. And this is what creates the opportunity because at, you know, 1840 bucks, the last time I calculated it out, it was, if they were to do the revaluation today, you would see spot gold go somewhere north of 12,000 bucks and, and much higher than that. So this is the Weimar Republic back in 1923. This is Russia in terms of the rubles, in terms of gold when they reset their currency in 1998. This is Venezuela that reset their currency and they're still resetting it again because it doesn't just happen once. Uh, in 2018, and this just happened in December in Iraq, and they revalued the Iraqi dinar. So my uh, point and what I want people to understand is you always want to look for an undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend and avoid an overvalued instrument that is in a long-term negative trend. The dollar is in a long-term negative trend. I don't care what the stock market does. Again, a trillion times zero is still zero. 
So we can look at how gold behaved in this country as we were transitioning from that 1971, and that's when they created the spot market to keep people away from the gold market because once it's in your possession, it's private and they can't do anything with it. But if you believe Wall Street's paper, well, then it's easy to do. And this is where this is where spot is from the beginning of this big experiment that's now over. The experiment is over. We are transitioning into a new. It's been a pleasure, Lynette. And we look forward to working with you again. Um, and I'm sure that Lisa will find some dates in the future for Absolutely. us to do this again and again and again until we yep. get it. Yep. And, and it sounds like there's other things in the works too. And, uh, you know, maybe I can be involved in that as well. Hold on one second, everybody. This is Lisa Riley with Odo Synergy Services, Women of Color Global Entrepreneur Network. And we just had the phenomenal Lynette Zhang with us today for the first time, kicking off 2021, an economic reset. And we're going to be bringing her back in the future and talking about um, other options and ways to protect our um, financial resources, wealth building, and preparing for um, this economic, protecting ourselves from this economic uh, crazy. Have a great rest of the week. God bless and take care.